Welcome. Today we are chatting with Maria Espinosa, who is one of the candidates, one of three, for the position of Secretary General of the OAS. And she has the support, nominated by Antigua and Barbuda, uh, and has the support, I believe, of a number of Caribbean countries. But we're not here today to talk about that too much. We may touch on one or two things. I want to learn a little bit about this fascinating person. Now, originally, you are from Ecuador. Ecuador. Yes. Indeed. And you're, you spent a number of years in academia um, as a professor. Uh, yes, and you also did, uh, you wrote a number of uh, articles. And some of your specialties in some of your um, university degrees relate to the environment and sustainability, uh, that sort of stuff and so on, the important stuff, yes? <laughs> Tell me Indeed. a little bit about your, your academic career, first of all, before we get into the other stuff. I, I started, you know, very, very uh, early uh, as a linguist. Mm -hmm. That is my original uh, training. But uh, through linguistics, I uh, landed and arrived uh, to, for a specific project in the Amazon region. And I very quickly understood that language was important in, in, in terms of uh, cultural identity, but uh, perhaps more equally important was language connected to culture and connected to traditional knowledge. And I started to, I started to make that connection uh, between nature and culture. And, uh, and uh, I, I was uh, fascinated by that. Uh, I, I had a degree, I studied a master's degree on Amazonian studies, uh, which is very particular. And then I did my doctoral studies in environmental geography in the United States. So I'm a geographer by, by training. And um, basically my, my main um, uh, activity was to teach. I, I was in academia writing academic articles um, and I was hired by the World Conservation Union, uh, IUCN, uh, which headquarters is in Switzerland. I moved to Switzerland. And my work was to advise the union on indigenous peoples and biodiversity policy. Uh, I, and I got very much involved in the international environmental agenda. And uh, after that, I was appointed regional director of IUC in Ecuador. And I got, you know, very in, very active in, uh, you know, supporting uh, the then incoming government for Ecuador, just providing the technical advice and support, etc. And uh, because of my involvement in that, I was then appointed foreign minister because of my international exposure and experience during a decade of working on climate change negotiations, biodiversity negotiations, to actually be in the multilateral international world. So I became um, the foreign minister of, of Ecuador and I started more of a political career, but. Uh, I never stopped, you know, my academic interests in my uh, poetry interests as well, because uh, uh, I can define myself as a, as a poet. I have published several poetry books, and, and I think it's um, the most, the best way to honor language. So you segued away from your work in environmental studies and uh, indigenous studies. Uh, into a political career. How, how difficult was that transition for you? Well, to be very honest with you, it wasn't so abrupt in a way because uh, in my adult life, I was very much connected mm. uh, you know, to the public, public interest, the public agenda. I was an activist on environmental issues, on indigenous rights. Uh, for a long time, you know, from academia. I mean, it, when you're in academia, you, you just, you don't just sit and write and teach, but mm -hmm. you have exposure to the real world. So, and, and of course it, it was a, a major challenge, but I, I knew uh, the international environment somehow. It was a challenge, but it was a wonderful experience. And once you enter public service, um, it is something that you want to continue doing, to, to this serve. concept of serving, mm -hmm. and uh, it's tough, especially for women. Women in politics, we, we have to face a lot of hardship, 
uh, to, to say the less. And it, it is a difficult world. It is still a world that is uh, governed by men mostly. And Predominantly, unfortunately. Yes, yes. At and, times. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, um, how the world is, but we are here to change it precisely. When I was appointed Minister of Defense, that was also a major, you know, breakthrough. Well, that's that's a, major, a major change for you. I mean, going from foreign affairs and the environment and so on to uh, defense. At the time, uh, I was the Minister of Cultural and Natural Heritage. I was in my, as we say in Spanish, in su elemento, in my world. Mm -hmm. you know, it was the Alimento, perfect, yes. Uh, yes, the perfect combina combination. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I put together a uh, um, state policy on preservation, uh, boosting our natural heritage. And, and I think the very name of that ministry, uh, it's, it's a breakthrough. It's an epistemological breakthrough mm -hmm. because it brings public policy cultural and natural public policy together, Ministry of the Environment, Ministry of Culture together. And I, I don't know, we should ask uh, by the then president, but he wanted someone with a, with a good uh, management capacity to be able to uh, undergo a profound structural change in the military. He wasn't very much to know about the, the, the types of planes and mm -hmm. weapons, armaments, and, and so on. Well, yeah. I have a little bit. I had a, 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 a good background because uh, you know I've, I've studied geopolitics. Uh, I was, uh, you know, I knew about uh, that world without being a specialist. But I think that uh, what was intended is a good manager to restructure absolutely. the military. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's what I did. I it all comes down to management then, yes? Yes, and, yeah. and also to, to uh, uh, have the legitimacy and the strength uh, to be at the top of a very, um, how you say in English, um, hierarchical, 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 called, yes. hierarchical uh, mm -hmm. organization. Let me, I, I want to take you back to uh, some of your studies and I want to talk a little bit about the Amazon and you're an expert in this, in this area. And I want to pose the question, why, why is the Amazon such an important um, area of the world for us, for mankind, for humanity? The, the Amazon Basin is shared by eight countries in, in South America. And, um, it, you know, nature does not understand about national borders. Mm. No, it, it goes beyond that. Yes. Ecological dynamics are, you know, broader, bigger, and far more complex than, you know, a borderline between mm -hmm. uh, one country and the other. Um, the Amazon happens to be the biggest watershed in the world, and the area of this of our planet with the highest concentration of biodiversity. And biodiversity comes together with cultural diversity. The, the very important presence of indigenous peoples in the Amazon Basin is, uh, is extremely important uh, because basically their knowledge, their ecological knowledge about the environment is of incredible value. The majority, for example, of the drugs and medicine that we know today, uh, most come from these areas and the starting point for the new medical discoveries come from this uh, indigenous communities and this traditional knowledge. And the way not only they know about the specific of certain species and their qualities, but they do know uh, for hundreds and hundreds of years about the ecological dynamics of the yeah. tropical rainforest. But what it does, it holds, it captures CO2, which is the gas that produces uh, a, a global warming and climate change. So having said that, um, and I'm going to be slightly political now, why is it then, in your opinion, I mean, this is a very broad and general question, but then why is it that so many world leaders, um, so many people who should know better, appear not to know better? Well, I think that um, these are 
incredible paradox, and I don't have a straight answer for, for that. But what I can tell you is that nowadays, we do have the scientific information. It's not that we don't know, and it, it is evidence-based. We have the science. We have the technology, because we, we have, for example, low-carbon technologies, renewable energies, so we have alternatives, you know? And we have the, the, um, the possibility of making the difference. So there is no excuse. You cannot argue that, oh, I didn't know, oh, I didn't have enough information, or even some say, but you know, climate change does not exist. Mm -hmm. It is an existential threat. And I am here in a country that is part of a community and of a region of the world that is the, one of the most vulnerable in this entire uh, planet, uh, you know, regarding climate change yes. and the uh, devastating effects of it. Where I want to ask you, um, if you are successful in this in this position, and I certainly hope you will be, um, what do you think that what is it that you would place as your priorities for for this region? Is that the OAS and the founding charter of the OAS has four pillars. Four. One is democracy, strengthening of democracy, excellent, very good, multidimensional security human rights as a cross-cutting issue, of course, it's about human dignity and existence, and development. What we have seen, unfortunately, is that these four pillars are not working in an interconnected, holistic manner. We have given a lot of weight to one or two, but no more than that. And believe me, 98% of the membership of the OES, of the 34 countries that are members of the OES, they want to have an OES deliver on their priorities, which mostly are connected to financing for development, to building resilience to climate change in climate finance, to uh, low carbon technology transfer, to capacity building, to institutional strengthening, uh, more uh, scholarships, uh, to use the OAS as a platform for dialogue on critical issues for the Caribbean, for example, like financial services. Uh, we are not specialists, but we can be conveners. Uh, we can establish platforms uh, for dialogue with extra-regional partners, uh, whether it be the European Union and, and the, the big blocks, the BRICS, uh, what is the level of dialogue that the OAS has established with the big extra-regional partners? And I, I can tell you, you know, I was present in all the international uh, decision-making spaces as president of the UN General Assembly. I didn't see once the OAS represented or having a voice at the international level. So it is about development, it is about climate change, it is about women's rights, uh, the uh, um, jurisprudence at the OAS is so rich. We have com uh, inter-American conventions for about everything, for rights of persons with disabilities, for women's rights and against violence, uh, for indigenous people. There was a convention, inter-American convention on, on indigenous rights, uh, you name it. But they are like paper. And I think that we, we need to reboost an agenda that is inclusive, comprehensive, and doesn't look at one specific country or one or two issues. The beauty of multilateralism is the sovereign quality of states, regardless of your square kilometers or your demographics. You're all the same. Uh, and you can take collective decisions. Uh, you know, for the, 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 the well-being of your people. So there is also a big disconnect of the OAS, the OAS and the people we serve. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what I want to mend and reconnect. I have come to the conclusion that sometimes political cycles are shorter than nature cycles and environmental cycles. So there is a time clash. A politician thinks about short term in about the next election. And we should think, I, I am a politician, proudly. 
we, we should not think about the next election, election, but the next generation. That would be the good politics, a good politician. And, uh, and here we're talking about the big powers of the world. Uh, uh, everybody, we should all take responsibility. So collective action, strong leadership is much needed. And the way that you can really display collective uh, action and, 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 and global leadership is in a multilateral setting like the OAS and like uh, the opportunity I had to serve. I had to serve as president of the United Nations General Assembly. So I, I have absolutely no doubt that you will be an exceedingly uh, successful Secretary General. And, um, uh, for what it's worth, Capital Media is, is going to give you that support. And we want to thank you for taking some time this morning and coming here to, to chat with us. Um, and when March the 20th comes around, I certainly hope that we will see that name up there, Maria Espinosa, Secretary General of the Organization of American States. Thank you, Vic. It's been a privilege to sit here at the red couch <laughs> and to have this, uh, this very nice uh, conversation, uh, of course. And Thank you, thank you uh, to you and to Capital. And when you come back as Secretary General, we will hope you'll come back to the Red Couch again. Oh, I will, definitely. Promise. That's a promise. That's a promise. That's a promise. Thank you so much, Maria. I thank you. Thank, thank you. you.